Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome, and hopefully you can hear me. I see that Chris Downs is in the house. Thank you, Chris. Good to see you, my friend. And so, uh, great. I'm looking forward to today. I hope you are too. Uh, just getting set up. And so uh, my name is Rich Sheffrin, and uh, I do these live streams every Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesdays from 2 to 6, Thursdays from 6 to 8. Uh, both times are Eastern. I won't be doing this Thursday, although I believe that Matt Rizvi, uh, my partner, will actually be doing the live stream as I head down to Cabo uh, with my girlfriend, Kim, as we go to Amber Spears event, uh, the Mimosa mastermind that is down there. And uh, I think some strategic profits uh, clients will be there as well. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'm just getting, we're having trouble streaming to LinkedIn. All right. So if anyone's watching on LinkedIn, please let me know uh, if you are seeing this. And um, what we're going to be talking to you, what we're going to be talking about today is something that we started uh, last week on the last live stream, um, where I was sharing one of the books that have been uh, instrumental in my success that have really made a big difference for me. And what I said during that last live stream was that I'm often asked by people like, what is my favorite book? And or what are my top three favorite books? And I've read literally thousands of books. And I don't really have a favorite because I have a favorite for specific times in my life, specific problems, specific challenges, specific issues. So I'm always, uh, when someone asks me for a book recommendation, I'm always, well, what are you looking for? What are you trying to achieve? What challenges do you have, et cetera? What are you interested in? Because uh, there's too wide of a range and uh, I don't really have, like I said, a favorite book. But I have some very, very I do have some very like, topics that are near and dear to my heart that have made a big difference in my life that I've read lots of books around. And so no individual book, I would say, like covered the whole thing in a way that was easy for me to fully appreciate. But reading several books or many books around a certain topic have certainly made a huge difference for me. And one of those areas that, um, that made a profound difference for me and also has made a, um, big difference in my own life and then also has helped me make a big difference in the lives of the people that I work with um, are books that are, are centered around transformation. And there are a lot of topics that tie into transformation. Uh, ontological coaching is one of them, if you've ever heard of that, or ontology, um, the area of philosophy called ontology. ontology. And, uh, and so that uh, plus other areas of um of speech that's another area that's uh very big in transformation uh and the idea that um we not only describe things with speech but we actually create realities out of speech and the impact of that and so i shared a book a while back um and i shared some distinctions from that book but not very many um a book called uh language in the pursuit of happiness. And I want to return to that book at some point to share more of what I got from that. But, um, but today, what we're talking about, about is a book, like I said, that we started on the last live stream, which is You Are What You Say. And it was uh, written by two doctors who run a program, two Harvard Medical School doctors um, who run a program in Boston, a uh, six-week program that helps people really overcome a lot of the challenges in their life because while pain is biological, suffering is more mental. And so, uh, and it's, we are so much more impacted by language than most of us realize. And language has a lot more power than we realize, but because we live in it, we can't see it kind of like fish to water, right? Everything a fish does is related to water in some way, shape or form, but fish living in the water and knowing no different uh, cannot appreciate water. We live in language. We live in language and conversations that started way before we were ever born. These conversations existed, life existed. Um, this was considered a marker before I was ever born. And so when I was born into this world, it came with language that already predefined things. And those definitions and that conversation that the world has, right? When you're born, you kind of fall into that. And that's why in transformation, they often say, um, 
you have lots of options, but no possibilities. And what they mean by that is, is that you have the ability to choose, right? Lots of di from different options, option A, option B, option C. But because we were born into a world that already existed before we got here and that that world had a momentum and a thrust of its own that we kind of fall into that and don't necessarily appreciate our power to, to consciously choose um, many different things that kind of just most people are kind of drifting through. And I don't know if that makes any sense to you guys, but, um, but my hope is, is that it does. And so what I thought we would do today is kind of quickly review what we covered. And then today, what I really wanted to focus on, um, I told uh, my team that I thought we would focus on, and I just want to find the name of it again in my notes, um, but I think it was called the 10 something's here. So let me just see. And it ties together a lot of the stuff that we talked about. Uh, yeah. So it's the 10 linguistic viruses. And so, uh, but as always, what I most want out of this is a dialogue, a conversation between you and I, um, I can sit here and just kind of ramble stuff off all day, but that really doesn't have very much usefulness for you, nor does it have for me. So, uh, please let's make this as much a conversation as we can and less of a monologue. You'll get more out of it. I will get more out of it. You have to engage in learning to get something out of it. It can't be totally passive. And in addition to that, your engagement also helps, uh, not only you learn more, helps me make this a better live stream for everyone, but also in addition to that, the algorithm gods of Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn and everywhere else uh, reward us based on engagement, that the more active you are, the more likely they are to show it to others. And we do this so that we can impact as many people as we can. So by all means, please emote and comment. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe. If you're watching on Facebook, please join our Facebook group. And by all means, no matter what platform you're on, if you are willing to share it, I really appreciate you sharing it. And if you share it, put hashtag shared into the comment section. And this way I can thank you personally, but I can see your comments. And so let's say hello to who's with us here and then we can dive into some of the content and I'm feeling better. So thank you for all of you guys who wished me well. My heart rate is still elevated, which is kind of strange about 10 beats per minute. I asked my doctor yesterday, um, you know, my resting heart rate is usually in the fifties. It's in the sixties right now and uh, has been for the last couple of weeks since I've been sick. And my doctor was like, yeah, you know, nothing to do there. Just take it easy. And so it's like I'm constantly debating whether I love working out. Every time I seem to push myself hard, I get sick again. So I'm taking it somewhat easy. Um, thank you for this. I'm grateful. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hey, Tuan, nice to meet you. And nice to see you on this live stream. Um, Jason in Tampa, good to see you. Uh, not fully recovered, but I'm getting there. And I leave on Thursday for uh, Cabo. And then we're in Cabo for like a week. And then uh, we go to Vegas because I'm speaking at Jeremy Blossom's event. Uh, hey, Lisa in Miami Beach. Good to see you. And Adam, good to see you, Mr. Weber. And Stephen in Kenya, very far, but yet so close when we're doing things online. So good to see you, Stephen. And Justina, uh, Love transformation coaching. Very cool. Um, I actually found you through my subconscious transformation coach, Jim Fortin. Oh, I know Jim really well. And actually, when uh, when we I did as an experiment in my offices, um, a three different transformation events for entrepreneurs. Jim was at the very first one, which I think was probably the best one that I did. Um, I was testing it out to see, one, the impact it would have on people, two, how much I enjoyed it. Three, whether this was something I could scale up. Uh, one, it had a tremendous impact on people. It was probably one of the most powerful things I ever did. Uh, two, I did enjoy it. But three, it was very difficult to market it um, because so many people confuse self-help and transformation. And transformation is like, you know, an, a, a, a much bigger alteration of who you are. And it's not about a little bit better, more or different. It's, you know, it's something more profound than that. And so what I found when doing these transformation workshops 
I always had a co-leader with me, someone from Landmark or someone from LifeSpring or, you know, someone who was well-versed in transformation and could be very confrontational when needed be, because most people hold on to their shit way past uh, it working for them. But people are unwilling, most of us, myself included, all of us, are unwilling to give up what doesn't work uh, in exchange for the unknown. And so oftentimes, like when we did these transformation workshops, um, people, some of my best clients would come in loving me by Friday, like Friday morning, by Friday night, they hated me, wanted to get a refund, wanted to go home. And then by Sunday, they loved me more than they ever loved me before and made a bigger difference in their lives from that weekend than anything else. But that kind of emotional drama, plus the difficulty in marketing it in a way where people truly get it, um, made me realize that this was not really where I wanted to stick my stake in the ground and spend a lot of time on, uh, especially because I still feel like I have a lot to grow and I don't like selling stuff that I feel I am still weak in from a standpoint of being congruent. So, uh, but very cool that you found me from Jim. Jim is extremely knowledgeable in that space. <laughs> Uh, hello, Emmy, uh, from, I can't even, Brauschwig, Germany. I uh, can't wait to learn from you to ready as usual, pen and paper. Cool. Nice to hear that. Uh, what is distinct between marketing, embellishment, assessment, and assertion, and how to differentiate an embellishment from a lie? I guess it all depends on your definitions, Tuan. Uh, I would say an assertion, right? is backed up by proof and assessment is more a standard uh, embellishment is more an exaggeration embellishment um most marketing has some embellishment in it it's called puffery in advertising and it's oftentimes the There's a lot of embellishment. And I would also say that spin can also kind of run parallel to embellishment and a great a great example of spin as it relates to marketing um, was, is like when I, the very first product or the second product I bought from Jay Abraham, I think. Um, it doesn't really matter whether it was the first or the second actually. Um, but I bought something, it was five grand or something like that. I should have received it like in two weeks. In three weeks, I got a letter telling me it was going to be delayed another month or so. And uh, from this, I bought from Jay Abraham and how lucky I was that it was going to be postponed a month because it wasn't up to Jay's standards. And he's doing X, Y, and Z in the next 30 days to make sure that it's even better than what I originally purchased. And, you know, there is, look, at the end of the day, the course being delivered that I bought was late. Um, and nothing is going to change whether it was late or not late, right? Part of marketing though is helping the person who is the recipient of the message to recognize that there are good things for them to come because of that. And so it's really, you can't, you're not, you know, in that particular case, it's not lying, right? It's not saying it's not going to be late. But what it is saying is that it's going to be late because what we're doing to it is going to make it even better so that when you receive it, you're going to be that much more happy. And I'd say that that's embellishment, right? Um, it might be true, but it's also spinning. Like we're taking lateness and we're turning it into a plus. And so a lot of marketing is that. It, these are ungrounded kind of assessments, which can be spin or embellishment, um, but we're trying to give people a perspective that is most conducive to it being positive for us and also foster the sale. So it's one thing to say that, you know, to get a letter that says the, the thing that you bought is not going to be delivered for another month and a half. And we're really sorry. Right. Uh, versus you're not going to get it for another month and a half but you should be very thankful as to why, because what we're adding to it is a lot more than what you actually paid for. And so what you're going to get is more comprehensive, more beneficial, more valuable than even what you paid for. Now, totally different. The net effect of the message is the same. It's late, but how it's perceived is very much based on what is surrounding um, that 
actual piece of information. And so that is part of spin. That's part of marketing. I hope that's makes things a little bit clearer. Twan. And now we have, uh, John Michelle just ordered. You are what you say three days ago. Thanks, Rich. Oh, my pleasure, man. Uh, good to see you, Rich, your neighbor in Highland beach. Hi, Glenn. Good to see you as always. Uh, me too. Cool. Um, yay, Emma. <laughs> Thank you. Um, shared Steven, you are my hero. Thank you so much. Uh, subscribe, shared, blank, like, talked to many of my friends about you. You're the best, Rich. Well, no, that's very nice, Hamza. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to Cabo in two weeks. I'll just miss you. Oh, bummer. That is a bummer. Um, I don't even know if I've ever been to Cabo, so I think this might be the first time. Uh, hello, Sergio in California. Good to see you. And Max in Boynton. Oh, you're just a hop, skip, and a jump from here. Uh, I'm in Delray. I can only imagine how powerful it was with both of you. Oh yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, transformation happens in subconscious identity. Yep, certainly does. Uh, shared on Facebook, Chris Downs, you are my hero as well. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, Rich, I'm loving this historical, the historical dimension to all this. Oh, cool. Uh, quick question, before we move to the main subject, how theory of constraints could ease the process of reaching your goals? Sure, um, oh my God. Uh, my sister's here. I'm glad I can tune in so I can see you. Yeah, it's, uh, well, between my traveling and being sick and working, I've just been slammed. Um, so sorry about that, Nadine. Nadine is my sister who used to live in France and has moved to Florida and I have yet to see her house, which I'm sure she's annoyed about, which I would be if I was her. Um, so the, let's see. So theory of constraints, how can it help ease the process of reaching your goal. So a couple things there, uh, Hamza. The first thing is just understand what theory of constraints is. And theory of constraints is a methodology that is about optimizing the throughput, the output, you could say, of any system. And every system has something that constrains it, right? Every system has a goal, right? So your business is a system. The goal is profit. Uh, you, your human body is a system. And the goal is to live a long, pleasurable life, you could say. But no system gets an infinite amount of its goal, right? You don't live forever. No business has infinite profits. No. So there's always something in the system that is currently limiting uh, the system from getting increased throughput, increased output. And because of that, right, um, that's what theory of constraints is all about to figure out what that one thing is that is currently constraining the system. And when you find that one thing through theory of constraints and remove that thing, or, you know, there's different methodologies to get around it, there will be something else limiting the system. There's always something, right? But the question is, is whether it is just whatever it is versus you choosing what it is. So the, that, is part of like what theory of constraints is all about. Now, what I would say is, is that um, it's probably excessive for someone to learn if they're learning a lot of other things about online marketing, uh, because uh, it certainly is rigorous. It, it's, it's, you got to do a lot of thinking to learn it. Um, and there's maybe not an immediate payoff. Like there's not anything specific that you might be able to do that you couldn't do before, except using theory of constraints. However, when I taught theory of constraints back in 2008 and uh, taught it to a group of a couple thousand entrepreneurs during a 45 day daily live stream, uh, plus Q and A's, like it was kind of grueling. Um, the, what was really interesting to me was that not only did people learn their constraints and get good at it. I mean, that I expected that I was teaching it. Right. But what I noticed that I did not expect did not even, it wasn't even a goal of mine or anything like that was that my experience of each student client was that they became better entrepreneurs during that process. And as like a side benefit to learning theory of constraints, and my belief is, is that the reason why that happened, although I'm, now I'm just guessing, right, is that, you know, when you're working with theory of constraints and you're really learning the tools, I mean, not just reading the book, The Goal, because like there's no, that's just a general overview. That's not like rolling up your sleeves and actually doing the work of like what a Jonah would do, which is like the highest level of certification, right? Like to, to apply 
uh, theory of constraints, um, you have to map out the cause and effect relationships of what is currently going on in your business or your life. And because of that, that mapping of cause and effect, you begin for many people, I guess, I think I maybe I have already thought this way or maybe I just benefited from it and I didn't realize it when because I was doing it myself to myself. But um, studying and mapping out the cause and effect relationships of your life or your business opens your eyes to how uh, something that you're doing over here actually impacts 10 things over here. And so your decision making gets better because you're able to see the implications of decisions better than before. So there is a benefit from there. And it is like a way of thinking ultimately that can help you dramatically. But I just don't know where I would put it in the scheme of things for an individual, because it really would depend on like what currently is in their way. Is it more like how they think about their business, how they move their business forward, et cetera, or is there a specific tactic or strategy or way of marketing that is currently missing from their business or product development strategy or something else? So it's hard for me to say that, but, um, but it could ease the process of reaching your goal because it would have you think differently about achieving your goal and what's really standing in your way. So the last thing I'll say about this, but I think this is valuable for anyone, regardless of whether you ever use theory of constraints or not, just even this one thing that I think is really valuable. Um, at the beginning of when I taught it, um, one of the things I was kind of surprised about was um, I asked people to kind of diagram out what their ideal business would be, like when it's finished, like you're trying to build this business, what will it look like when it's perfect in every way, you know, and what, you know, mapping it, diagramming it out from a standpoint of, you um, critical success factors, at, which I don't have time to get into right now, but like basically mapping out like what from a general way would this business need in order for it to be everything you wanted it to be. And the reason we start there is because that defines the boundaries of the system, because we look at this com like this end state, right, of like where the business we would want the business to be when it's done. And the next question from there, once we have that is, why isn't the business there now, right? Because we're looking to surface the problems, challenges, and issues, not any challenge, not any problem, not any issue, but just the problems, challenges, and issues that relate to having the business be the best that it can be, which is this vision in your mind. And so what I was kind of surprised by was how few people, when I first started teaching, and I had to teach more because of it, uh, could identify like what their business would look like when it was finished, which to me was like, well, then what are you trying to build? So that was a little interesting. And I think, uh, but recognizing that like we have something that we want this business to be, it's currently here. Why is this business that's here right now, not here already? And, you know, from there we start surfacing problems. Like we're not converting as well on our front ends. Our projects take longer to accomplish than we budget for. You know, whatever the issues are, we're not able to get affiliates. Um, whatever the, the issues are, and then from those issues, that's what we do the root cause analysis on, where there's then ultimately what's called the convergence of cause, where you start with maybe 10 causes, but when you start going deeper and deeper into asking why and like looking for the cause of that cause, right? What you find is what's called the convergence of cause where there's less and less causes the deeper you go until you find the one or two or three things that are responsible for most of the challenges that you have in your business. And then that's what you would attack. Um, and then there's methodologies of theory of constraints on how you would go about attacking that. So I hope that's helpful, Hamza. It's a very valuable way of it's a very valuable methodology. It's a very valuable way of thinking about business and systems and goals. Um, certainly would never hurt anyone. But the only reason I'm reluctant, Hamza, to say, yeah, you should definitely go study that is that, you know, there's an opportunity cost to every decision you make. And by studying theory of constraints, what you're not studying is anything else. And I'm not sure that that has the highest and best use for your studying time. Only you can decide that based on where you're at and what you're trying to achieve. Well, we got lots of people in Florida. Daryl is in Pompano, so you're the other way. Boynton's north, Pompano south. Got the Florida contingent. Uh, Hamza, that's brilliant. Rich, well, it's not me. Let's third constraints, but thank you for saying that. Um, so the working from the end makes you aware of the challenges to get to the vision or goal. Well, kind of, um, kind of, Stephen, it's, 
it's working from the end, but it's not saying like, it's not just reverse planning, right? Like reverse engineering your goal. It's more about like getting real as to why you don't have that, whatever your goal is, why aren't you there right now? Like what is currently, what has currently been going on that you're not already at your goal? Assuming that you didn't just choose this goal yesterday, right? So like it could be for weight loss, right? Like let's say I'm 230 pounds. I want to weigh 180. Why am I not 180 right now? I'm not 230 anymore, thank God. But like, why am I not? Well, because when I wake up in the morning, I don't eat the best breakfast or I don't do this. I don't exercise consistently, right? We can say all the reasons. And then from there, we do a root cause analysis as to that, right? We're trying to get to the deeper like causes of all this. And so that's, it's different than just reverse engineering, um, but has its benefits uh, in it uh, from what I'm trying to explain at least. So very cool, uh, cool. All right, so I guess we should kind of dive in, and I, that means I got to share some pages with you. Um, so I definitely took my notes a lot further, which is cool. So I'm going to share this one. I, I don't know if I can share more than one page, can I? Let's just see if I can. Can I share another page? No, I can't. All right. So um, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger here. I know I can. Actually, maybe I will first do this. And I know you guys can't read that. So let me make this bigger. I think it's this, right? All right. You guys should be able to read that, I hope. Let me know if you guys can. All right. And this is going to be such a big file now. So let's I wish there was a, how do I get rid of this top part? Can I get rid of this top part? View, uh, note. I just want to see if I can get rid of the top part. If I can. Do I see toggle full screen? Show recent notes in sidebar. No, I don't see it. All right. So I guess I have to keep that part, which kind of sucks. Let's see, maybe I can move this up. That's not going to make any difference. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, there's got to be a better way than this. I have to imagine. There we go. Okay. Uh, maybe make it a little bit smaller. It might be a little bit too big. There we go. All right. So uh, the book is You Are What You Say, right? And we talked about how we don't control our language. It controls us. Language flows from our structure and, and in turn shapes us that people can be imprisoned by their language, right? If you've been on these live streams for a while, you know that uh, a thing that I, uh, a statement that I've said numerous times is that we live our lot like uh, life is an internal experience that we mistake for an external. Like everything that happens is inside. Our perceptions drive our behavior, our actions, everything else. And our perceptions are internal. Uh, they're not what's truly outside. It's our filter of what's outside. And therefore, we live in this kind of self-made, self-described reality and each, even though we all are in the same reality, how we experience it is totally different. And what we see and what we think and what we feel and what the moods we feel, totally different. And that's based on the language that we have with ourselves, with others, et cetera. Um, okay. So, you know, does your life seem more like a struggle than a work of art? If this is so ask yourself, what is happening in my life that is causing me to suffer and not feel well? Do you have serious problems at home or at work? Are you overwhelmed because you can't say no to those around you? Do your children drive you crazy? Do you feel that you never have enough money? Do you distrust others? Do you feel unloved and joyless most of the time? Are you often embarrassed, isolated, or upset? Now ask yourself, do you want to change these circumstances? Do I want to learn how to live a different life, one filled with health, joy, and happiness? Uh, acknowledging the impact your personal history has had on your life, learning how you practice, 
how your practice and language affects and reflect on who you are and how you can use language in a healthier way, gaining control of your moods, your emotions, and becoming aware of the automatic thoughts that play like a jukebox in your head. So I went through the rest of this, as I said I would, and did all the highlights, and we went over quite a bit of it um, last week. Um, you know, the I would imagine most of you don't have this problem, although I have some friends that kind of experience this, the I am the way I am syndrome. Like they've kind of resigned themselves to being who they currently are and they can be no different. Now, one thing that even before I even proceed any more on this, just to kind of go back to me for a second here, the, you know, it's kind of funny because, well, or you could say that, like, I have two thoughts that are somewhat in conflict, but I don't see them in conflict at all. And I just want to make sure that you don't see them in conflict. So one of the things that I teach business owners all the time, uh, that one of the keys to me being as successful as I have been in helping so many entrepreneurs succeed is helping them recognize that they design their business around some mythical entrepreneur that they are currently not. That, you know, instead of designing a business to thrive in, based on who they currently are right now. They just design a business based on like some ideal entrepreneur that they hope to be one day. So my point is, is that if you're a perfectionist or you're a procrastinator, or you're not as money motivated as you should be, then you need to engineer that into your business so that the business can thrive with you being a perfectionist or a procrastinator or not being money motivated, that you don't put the condition of your business's success on your own personal change. And the reason you don't is that a great book was written over a decade ago cha called Change or Die. And it was written by a well-known cardiologist, cardi cardiac surgeon. And, and it was all about that when given the choice that you must change or you will die, 90% don't change. So personal change is, is not easy. And I wouldn't suggest that someone base their business success on their own ability to change. Now, having said that, change is totally possible. I just don't think that you should take the very biggest bet in your life, which is your business, and make it on something that it doesn't have to be. It can be based on who you currently are today and therefore likely to be more successful and less likely for you to disappoint your business and to feel like in any kind of conflict. Now, having said that, though, of course, you can change and people improve over time. And hopefully you do. And hopefully I do. And so I'm not suggesting that people can't change. I'm suggesting that you don't want to base your business success on a specific change and certainly not on any kind of immediate change. But change is always possible. And the worst thing that you can ever be, in my opinion, um, is resigned to kind of being who you currently are. Um, I don't like we're on this planet for a very limited time. And I think, you know, any place where you feel resigned and are OK with that resignation, right, that you really got to check in and say, like, is that it for this area of my life for the rest of my life? And I hope that the answer is no, um, because the alternative is, is to just kind of be not that fulfilled and kind of just taking up space until you're no longer here, right? And a great way to think about resignation is, and I, I, I think if I remember correctly, um, this was like a landmark thing, but they, you know, there was a time in your life, there was a time in my life where, you know, you thought or dreamed about potentially changing the world or having a world impact or being a famous celebrity, like singing into a microphone and having the world respond, right? Um, over time, like we go from, wanting to make an impact in the world or changing the world to maybe just our country, then our community, then our family, then our family, then our friends until eventually like we might just be happy if we could change ourselves. Right. And so that is like a, that is like consistent resignation of moving to smaller and smaller. Right. And there's also an element of self-deception with resignation that, you know, someone there might be things that you want that you tell yourself you don't really want them because the alter, or, you know, like, I don't even know what would be an example of that, a mansion on the ocean, like something like that. But 
you're resigned yourself to not have that because you're not, you don't think you're capable of doing the work or something to that effect. So resignation is like a really kind of evil that many of us will deal with at different times of our lives. But the resignation that I believe is the worst is that I am the way I am, right? That there's this overall resignation about your personality and who you are and that this is just the way you're going to be or about your health or something else. And I just think that that's a very scary proposition. And I wanted to highlight that. So let me go back to you guys for a second. Then we'll go back to the notes and we'll go over the five different things that you can do in language that will then lead us to the 10 linguistic viruses and uh, see what you guys have to say. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you for diving into the full maps on how things work. Been super valuable for me. Well, great to hear that, Josh. And thanks for saying that. I appreciate that. Uh, I've always tried to improve myself and that's why I show up to your live stream. So much gold in the knowledge you're sharing. Well, thank you, April. And I appreciate that. Uh, who I am right now is unfortunately all three you mentioned and personal change in many directions is my hobby. I think being hungry to become a moneymaker is something I've never considered until now. Okay, who I am right now is unfortunately all three that you mentioned. What three did I mention? Is it um, like you're talking about resigned or is it something else? Uh, I don't remember. Um, and I think being hungry to become a moneymaker is something I've never considered until now. Well, that might be the thing that is most important for you right now in your current situation, in current context, everything else. So, uh, but tell me more, Vivienne. Vivian? Is it Vivian? I don't know. Uh, and be glad to try and help you as much as I can. So, all right, let's get back to my notes. Let's go back here. There we go. So this is, you know, one of the key points of this whole thing, right, is that most people believe that language describes reality. And what this person argues in this book, what I tend to agree is that language brings forth reality, right? Like Jay, when he sent that letter about the course being late, um, he created a new reality that it was delayed, right? Because he was adding extra stuff to it that changed the reality that, and the way it was perceived. Um, so um, there you go, right? Okay, so let's keep it going. Most of my patients think they're powerless over their moods. This is not so, right? Um, and, you know, there's this continual like thread with this book and with many different books in transformation as like about self-awareness and how much awareness is critical to growth. And so as I went through this book note, right, I also went through, um, let me just see where I, where it is, if I can find it real quick. No, I can't. Um, but I went through a few other books that I've also, um, uh, that I really enjoyed. So one was on uh, Gurdjieff, who was a Russian mystic who had a lot of, to say about self-awareness. He's also the gentleman that brought the Enneagram to back into the world. And then um, another book written by an author named Red Hawk, who was a professor, I think, at Yale, um, also about self-awareness. Uh, and so we'll be hitting that point at some point in the future, uh, but not today, okay? But I did wanna just mention that. Um, all right, so we're passing through the stuff that we reviewed before, and we reviewed all this, so I'm glad, and uh, just making sure. All right. The the books that I think just in total passing here uh, while I'm pulling this up, the books that I think were the best books I ever read, they were mo definitely the most comprehensive, um, were these three books, Coaching to the Human Soul. And you can't get them, I don't think, on Amazon. I think you have to buy them directly from the people that do ontological coaching in uh, Australia. Um, big, dense books, but very valuable. Um, that's all about ontological coaching. Okay, so we, uh, we went through all this, and um, 
we talked about Maturana and about the two things that seem so simple, but yet are very profound as far as like Maturana being this uh, world recognized biologist and that we are closed systems. So when you recognize that we are a closed system, you also have to recognize that nothing outside impacts you, that everything is a perception and it's your perceptions that impact you. And therefore, like nothing outside does anything to you. It's your perception of those things, which we've heard before, but this is the biological science behind it. And so that's the first like key point, right? That we are closed systems and that our closed systems use our perceptions to really create our reality. And that, that impacts so much, right? So let's just keep going though. I, I want to get to what we really kind of were talking about. Um, yeah. So here's just what we were talking about. Maturana's claim was that not only do machines work this way, but that living systems work this way as well. The behaviors elicited by the environment are determined by the structure of the living thing. The environment releases or calls forth these behaviors, but it does not determine them. The environment is like the starter key. We are like the car. Maturana gave this name structural determinism to this notion, right? Um, so they, and remember, he, the other experiment he did is he took a frog, he took the eyeball and rotated the eyeball 180 degrees, then see how the frog would react. Um, and we are all internally consistent, highly interdependent, structurally determined events. The environment did not come, did not come Barbara to experience the sequence of bodily events, rather it triggered her structurally determined system, right? So you're structurally determined to respond in a certain way until you condition new habits or new ways of response. Um, so this is about the frog, right? In his view, perception does not involve taking in an event or a thing, analyzing or trying to understand it, knowing, and then acting accordingly. Rather, perception and knowing are not representations of reality. They are reflections in action of what you as a mechanism see, understand, or do. In short, perception is structurally determined. How you see things is determined by how you hold yourself, the thoughts you have, your distinctions that you have. And this is where this starts to get really, really deep, right? Um, okay. So the implications of Maturana's teaching, I'm just going on this tangent here a little bit because I think it's useful. Um, the implications of Maturana's teachings are tremendous. First, if you want to change yourself, you have to change your structurally determined responses, not alter your environment. Now, that can seem very basic in certain ways, but it can also seem much more complicated uh, or deep, right? Like, so we're not saying, like, of course, like, it's how you react to things, not what happens, right? We've all heard that, and that's pretty obvious. What we're saying here, though, is bigger than that, is that you, like, in any given moment, you might not, you have less of a choice than you even perceive based on how you've already kind of structurally determined yourself based on all the experiences you've had, all the thoughts you've had, everything you've ever been exposed to. So if you want to change something, you have to recognize that you're actually changing your structure when you are like overcoming a habit or overcoming some negative thing that you need to overcome. And that, that, shouldn't be easy. It actually, to override your system takes a lot of conscious will in the beginning, a lot of pre-thought, a lot of forethought, and a lot of thinking in the moment and being present. So, you know, that is critically important and you can take it to levels of depth that like the, the simple things just don't really kind of Summarize. Second, if your responses are determined by your structure and if your structure is developed in your past, then at any given moment, you are doing only and exactly what your past allows. This gave me a biological basis for compassion and respect for myself and others. We are doing only what we can do given our history. And that is something that like you either buy into or you don't, right? That like, it's kind of like what Joe Rogan shared when he said when he had kids, Having kids got him to recognize that like all the assholes he meets are people that just weren't loved as kids. So he sees them as little angry children, right? It, he recognizes that who they currently are is based on stuff that was maybe outside of their control. 
Now, we can all change, right? But that doesn't mean that how I do something and how you do something, like they're going to be different. They're going to be based on the 50 years that I've lived and maybe the number of years you lived and what we've been exposed to, what we've thought about, who, you know, all the things that we've done. All right. Uh, okay. You know, the brain is plastic. We talked about that. Um, okay. Cognitive blindness. This is a critical point. This is why distinctions are so important, right? So cognitive blindness, we simply do not see what we do not see. That is to say, we don't see shapes, colors, light and dark, et cetera, right? It's not saying that we don't see those things. We do. But we don't see meaning and context unless living and learning has modified our structures. Maturana calls this structural coupling. That's why when I look out into the sky, all I see are stars, right? Other people see the, the signs of the zodiac, right? They see those celestial, like, whatever. I don't see them because I've never paid enough attention to them. I don't know them, like, right? So I don't see them. Just like since I don't play chess, when I look at a chess board, I just see a bunch of like things on a board, right? Whereas a chess master will see something totally different. So even though we're seeing the same thing, we're not noticing the same thing. Um, and it's then that noticing that really is the value. And that's why like oftentimes one of the reasons why I am so like such a huge fan of distinctions is that my belief is, is that successful entrepreneurs see things that unsuccessful entrepreneurs do not see. And it's the opportunities that they see that other entrepreneurs don't see because they're not coming with the same level of distinctions, right? It's the same reason why the original entrepreneurs that got online, myself being one of them, that we became gurus because we brought the distinctions of direct response with us online. So other people saw like, you know, a sale, we saw customer acquisition, we saw back ends, we saw, we had all these concepts already in our mind. So it's very easy to slot things into place. Whereas people who didn't have that in their mind, were just looking at a sea of confusion, right? So this is what we're, when we say cognitive blindness, it's not that you don't see, it's not that like I see a world that you don't see. It's that we see the same things, but what we notice of what we see is profoundly different. And it's based on who we are, what we've done, what our past is, et cetera. Um, Okay, so let's keep it going. Like, I don't want to re-go through all the book again, right? But there was this interesting thing here about this um, the this gentleman, uh, Edelman, right? Uh, for the last 20 years, Edelman has been studying how the brain changes with experience. He wrote a popular account of his findings. I haven't read this, but I want to. In 1992, called Bright Air, Brilliant Fire on the Matter of the Mind. In his book, he pointed to three aspects of the brain that account for its remarkable ability to generate both stability repetition of function and novelty, new structurally based function or learning. The first aspect is this is of genetics or what we inherit that equips us to live as humans. We have a structure in common with other human beings that allows us to speak, to walk on our hind legs. This basic set of functions is shared by members of the species, but also has inherited constraints. The second property he describes as follows. During life, the connection of nerve cells are selectively strengthened or weakened by biomechanical and physical processes with recurrence, a new anatomical network of function is carved out of the primary repertoire. And then uh, Edelman proposes that different parts of the brain connect and coordinate with one another through a process called reentry. Certain reentrant patterns become strengthened between different parts of the brain to produce complex behavioral responses. Your behavior is structurally determined and you can learn to alter your structure. Memory is not just in the brain. The state of your body in life at any given moment determines your possibilities and barriers for action. Um, in the course of development, we make certain choices to survive. These choices often involve dealing with fear, anger, and embarrassment by some armoring or automatic behavior that ensures survival. For example, a person who has been deeply embarrassed as a child may manifest an array of automatic behaviors that serve to avoid embarrassment. She'll sit in the back row at school, wear subdued clothing, never volunteer for a solo performance, etc. All unconscious actions, but patterned. 
In addition, her shoulders may be stooped, her, soft, her voice soft, and her face expressionless as she hides her emotion from what she feels is the watching and dangerous world. Such a person avoids fear and anxiety provoking situations with a set of somatic, that's like, you know, body, behavioral and emotional responses that Richard calls her conditioned tendency. He writes, it's a way of being we assume when we believe that on some level our identity is threatened, our muscles set in a particular way, we assume a certain posture, breathe a certain way, take a stance that literally manifests that tendency. This tendency, which is actually imprinted in the flesh by many years of use, takes over and we lose touch with the present moment, right? So hopefully that makes sense. And I'm hoping that you guys follow. All right, so now I really do want to get to um, the point of what we were going to cover today. All right. Just to be clear, um, so like... The, the, is everything that I just gone over, like, let's say the last 40 minutes or so, 50 minutes, like, has that made sense? And do you get it? And is that like, does it land for you the way it lands for me, which is like, this is pretty profound. Like, yes, there are elements of this that are very similar to very like pop self-help type of stuff. Sure. But when you start digging deeper into this, you recognize that really what you've been, or at least for me, what I've been exposed to in pop psychology about this stuff is the general generic version, but, but by going deeper, I could fully appreciate it and really understand it and therefore apply it, which is totally different. All right. All right. So this is now, we're just... So yeah, we, we got to this and hopefully you can still understand this statement, but like this, what this statement made sense if you followed everything that came before. Right. So by this point, you can understand when I make this somewhat unusual statement, a doctor is a person who has entered into practices typical of the culture of medicine so that his or her structure has been modified to perform the practice of a doctor. And the practices I've learned are the ones that my medical culture has shown me. So when a person walks into the doctor's office, what the doctor sees is a patient. What the doctor is noticing for are symptoms and trying to connect the dots, right? The, a doctor who has been doing that for many years can not help himself or herself from doing that. They entered into the culture of medicine. In the culture of medicine, they learned ways of thinking. They learned mental maps. They learned distinctions. And over time, even the way they perceive things is altered. And there's no choice in the matter, right? Like that's what needs to happen in order for you to be a doctor. And so what is the culture that you've entered into, right? So that like, what, how have you modified your being for what? And like the, the practice of what, right? And hopefully that kind of gets you thinking, right? Right, the era that you live in, your family, your culture, your work or profession, the unique experiences you have, both joyful and traumatic, all mold your structures as you embody them, right? All right. All right. Cool. All right. Let's go over just the major points from this chapter because I think it's the next chapter and then I'll go back to your questions and then we'll get into the good, good stuff. Okay. So major points in chapter three. You are born with genetic inheritance, the raw material of your being. Let me just see if I can make this bigger. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you are born with a genetic inheritance, the raw material of your being. This establishes a foundation of possibility for you. In addition to what you share with all humans, you are unique because of your own biological structure, which has been shaped by your life experiences. This shaping occurs in your cells and organs as you learn, and especially in your brain. The brain is the most plastic of your organs. Culture, family, and social class also shape you without your awareness. All right. 
In addition, you learn by, you also learn by intention as you did when you first enrolled in driving school or took ice skating lessons. At first, you needed a teacher to provide you with clear distinctions for action. With practice and repetition, your body changed and you could drive a car or skate without even thinking. Driving and skating now live in your body. You are a driver or skater. History shapes your body in all these ways. When you act or when you react, just remembered present, your history speaks through your body. In this way, your history shows you a world and how to act and live in it, right? Let me just repeat that. In this way, your history shows you a world and how to act and live in it, right? Your history shows you the world because it is, it is altering how you perceive things right now. But at the same time, it limits your freedom and your possibility. The Arab-Israeli conflict, as described by Shimon Perez, shows how the combatant thinking is so filled with blame and fear that peace will never occur without reshaping not just what the combatants think, but how they think. This is what leaders and great teachers do. They show the historic nature of our positions and invite us to build new possibilities from being and living. History shapes not only your cognitive life, what you know, but your emotional life, the state of your body. You react to a test, to learning, to challenge, to loss, to life itself as a in a stereotyped learned way. Awareness of your historically shaped reactions is the first step towards freedom's door. Cool. All right. So now... That's one of the reasons, right, why meditation is so critically important. In order for you to be the witness of, like, your thinking to gain greater depths of self-awareness, in order to do that, you must be able to be the witness. And if you haven't trained your attention to do that through meditation, it's impossible. And it's a lengthy process to begin with. So... You know, that's why meditation is so critically important, in addition to all the other benefits. All right. Yeah, so this might be useful because I don't think we talked about this. So this is Fernando Flores. This was the second big notable that this book was focused on. First one was Umberto Maturana, the biologist. The second is Fernando Flores, also just one of the most impressive people when you read this person's history. Um, okay. So he was imprisoned in Chile because as a political, um, he was part of the cabinet of the Chile Chilean president. And then there was a coup and he was put in jail for like 14 years, some length of time. I don't remember. And he said, this is, I never told this victim story about my imprisonment. Instead, I told the transformation story about how prison changed my outlook about how I saw that communication, truth and trust at are at the heart of power. I made my own assessment of my life. I began to live it. That was freedom. Fernando began his lecture with this statement. In language, we build our own identities, our relationships with others, the countries that we live in, the companies we have, and the values that we hold dear. With language, we generate life. Without language, we are mostly chimpanzees. So then I'm going to read you even stuff I didn't highlight here because I think it's valuable because I remember the story. Fernando asked us to repeat in unison with a deep, loud, whole body voice what he was about to say. I suggest that you read the next lines in the same manner. Life seems hopeless, bleak even. I have nowhere to turn, no one to turn to. What is more ominous is still is that this will never change, right? So that's the statement. Life seems hopeless, bleak even. I have nowhere to turn, no one to turn to. What is more ominous still is that this will never change. After we finished, Fernando reminded us to say the next statement in the same manner as we had the last one. Then he began again. Nothing will help. There is no one to turn to. It feels like the Almighty has forgotten me. Times are hard. This will not get better. They will probably get even worse, though this is beyond imagination. 
As the last words reverberated through the hall, I felt a heaviness in my chest and weighed about a ton. The problems in my life appeared before me. My inability to help my patients, the unhappiness I felt over my recent divorce, the sense of loneliness that pervaded my private life. Other people reacted in a different way. Several sobbed. The number laughed nervously. Most sat stunned in amazement at what was happening. Fernando, as if by magic, had changed the mood of each individual in the room. I asked myself, how did this happen? He, how did saying these words shift the way my body felt? Just then, Fernando asked, what actions are you likely to take or not take in the mood that you are in right now? I remember thinking to myself that in this mood, antidepressants looked like a good option. Ambition or creativity seemed impossible. The person next to me remarked, in this mood, I feel like doing, all I feel like doing is crawling into a hole. Do you see, Fernando bellowed from behind the podium, do you see that your speaking has changed your body, your mood, your physiology, and your possibilities for action? Language has generated a moment of life for you. The action of languaging changed you like a drug. Even though you rationally knew that this was only an exercise, it happened anyway. So if language is so central to human life and all of its dimensions, then part of our attempt is to create a new awareness of mind and body, new distinctions about language, right? That must involve building linguistic awareness. You have, when you have distinctions, you have awareness because you're able to see things that other people can't. F facility and competence. You are in language already all of the time, but you are not skillful at observing it because you have no powerful distinctions for doing so. With skill at observation comes more success in life and less suffering. Distinctions help us to live more powerfully with what is already happening, okay? What is worry, really? It's your ability to build a picture in language of what could be in the future, a picture that looks frightening or dangerous, and then fall into a mood that corresponds to that picture as if it were true. What you forget is, is that you're, are, you are the artist drawing the picture. Once you imagine this world, your body does the rest. It does what your historical structure allows you to do when you worry. Some people jump into action. Some become paralyzed and anxious. Others deny the concern. Some individuals distract their worries using food, alcohol, music, or TV, right? Pain happens to the body. Suffering is a function of language. I truly believe that. Um, all right. So let's see if we finally get to it. If language is the foundation upon which human life is built, on which we construct our human interactions and even our notions of self, then competence in language will bring you more satisfaction, joy, and effectiveness in living. This is my claim. When people become aware of their behavior in the linguistic domain, they achieve greater effectiveness, greater satisfaction, and a better mood. I would love to share something with you, and I don't know that I, I think it's worthwhile because I think it will illustrate what is being said about this. So let me just see if I can pull this up real quick. And if I can, I will explain it. Um, and while I'm doing that, I will also go back to you guys for a second. Let's see. Um, seeing if I have a PDF version of what I'm looking for. If not, I will use. All right. So I have it as pages. All right. I guess I can open that. All right. And while I'm doing that, let's check back in on you guys. All right. All right. Makes sense. Most more likely we take responsibility for what we are. You, yes, but it's more than that. It's recognizing that you're doing the best that you can, but like how you see things is, is defined by everything that you've done in the past. And if you want to change, alter, right? Like, it has, to, it's an internal job uh, that makes great sense, especially about seeing, but not seeing the opportunities I need to go after. Definitely aligns with me. Cool. It's true. Cool. All right. Uh, my practice in medicine is absolutely shaped by my training, but we try to keep learning. The learning gives us a structure. True. How do I find my bias or blind spot? I will get to that by what I'm going to show you. Okay. 
Um, I do not think genetics totally determines you. It's a condition. Yes, but you start genetically and then the conditioning lays on top of that. That's what we're saying. Abel, always be learning every day begins my day. Oh, that's a nice way to think about it. We need to overcome history. Yes. Uh, the copy you are scrolling is easily readable. Thanks. Uh, Vivian, I'm an entrepreneur since I was 14. I'm now 28. I think that shaped me most till this point in my life. And I'm married to an entrepreneur too. How crazy. <laughs> uh, language crafts who we are and how people perceive us personal branding. Yeah, but in a deeper way too. Uh, meditation and workout are both great. I prefer working out because as much as you stretch your body's tolerance towards physical pain, the more your mental state stretches and enables the genius in you. Got it. Still, there's other benefits of meditation. Uh, Lisa, pain is the one thing that really undermines us and my motivation in living a healthy life. It's fun to indulge when celebrating with others. I must remember that outcome. Nevertheless, I have periodically devastated by unlenting pain, which has eroded all, my, which has eroded my life and derailed my mission. Then Lisa, what you have to do is you have to get at that. You have to get at that pain. Uh, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything that you haven't heard before. Um, so what, so I, I think I've told you that I had this guy, um, one time ago shadow me, right? Like he was an awareness coach. Like he came, spent several days with me and basically went everywhere. I went like, you know, pointed out to me what I did not notice and wrote a book for me on how like to leave behind so that I could have something to consistently improve upon. Um, all right. So this is going to be a tangent. I think this tangent is worth your time. I am, I am, uh, okay, so this is, uh, okay, that's not the right one. So let me just do this again. Hold on. Because there's a second one. Where is it? Uh, okay. Uh, hold on, guys. Uh, edit. I'm looking for find. Find, find, find. There it is. Find. Oh, there it is. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Uh, all right. Ticket. Okay. All right. This... All right. I'm just trying to see like what to share that will be most valuable to you guys. All right. This is a lot of reading. This was profound to me. I think it could be profound for you guys. So I want to share it with you guys. Okay. Um, All right, let's see, I'm gonna share. I'm gonna stop this screen for a second and then I'm gonna share the screen. And I'm gonna share this window and here we go. I'm gonna get rid of this. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger and I'm gonna get rid of this, all right. Uh, cancel. All right. I just want to make this bigger. Let's go to perfect. All right. Maybe even a little bit bigger. Can I go to 225? Fit with. How about that? All right. Cool. Okay. Okay, so this is not about Jay Abraham. This was a different Jay, just so that people are clear. Um, we sat at dinner. Okay, data from the depths. We sat at dinner, and all the waiter or waitress was to you was a person delivering the food. Each one was a tool to me, a tool to explore myself and what is possible with people. When Jay approached on Saturday, I knew his patterns before he even spoke a word to you and confirmed these patterns many times as he droned on, not really listening to a word you said as you painfully suffered his slow and dull energy. You, of course, didn't know that you were sitting in the too hot sun suffering a boring guy because the data is only available in the depths. 
over and over throughout my visit, I watched as you squandered opportunities, energy, and ability. I also watched as you sort of like a human sun shining on everyone and everything around you. As you shift your attention to your depths, you will be able to focus on your energy and use it much more effectively and efficiently. You gather more content in a day than any 10 people I know. You accelerate the pace of learning content to an alarming degree, multitasking and jumping from subject to subject and at work from project to project and a person to person like the master that you are. And you do all these things with attention only on one level. While it may seem like I'm repeating myself, and I probably am, I'm just continually amazed at how much you do with so little. I can and will assist you in the process of tapping into your depths. In fact, I will be delighted to do so. In doing so, we will build a map of how to access the depths. While this map will be the map of Rich, with some modifications will work for other people as well. It is possible and even likely that the tools that we discover on our journey into the depths of Rich will be both profoundly useful and powerful. That, like, so he had never written a book like this for anyone. He felt compelled to do it for me because he felt like by helping me, he'd be able to kind of create a model that he could help others. Okay. The journey begins with the first step. And this is where it starts getting real. Okay. The first thing that we need to do, the first step of this journey is to establish an orientation. You need to learn up from down, inside from outside, and east from south. Without orientation, you will start out lost and probably only get more lost as we go. Orientation provides a footing in where you are so that you can begin to explore where you want to go. Most people lack orientation, which is why they work really hard and never get anything done. Most people don't know their ass from a hole in the ground. Yikes. I don't even want you to imagine the problems this causes, but watch people and you will see people continually not acting in their own best interest. This is because their own best interest isn't available to them on the surface. At the beginning of the journey, before you do anything, before you think of anything, before you even decipher or choose anything, you must orient yourself. In this case, of, in the case of deep personal exploration, the necessary orientation is attitude. What is attitude, I hope you ask? Lots of people talk about attitude, but few really know what it is. Attitude is your philosophical orientation for how friendly or unfriendly the world is. Put a little more simply, attitude is the answer to the question, what is it like out there in the world? If you start with the wrong attitude, it won't matter if you do the right things. I define attitude as a specific orientation towards everything. I have discovered a single attitude that provides me with more possibilities and keeps me consistently growing no matter what I'm doing. The attitude that I suggest here will serve you in a foreign country. It will serve you in the depths of yourself. It will serve you at a restaurant. It will serve you in your business. It will make your vacations more fun and rewarding. And not only have people like you, but have you like them and you like yourself as well. Attitude uh, will provide an overall unchanging method or approach to all that you meet on your journeys. With the proper attitude, it won't make any difference whether you are lost or found, whether you're winning or losing, or whether you are currently thinking you are right or wrong. Without the proper attitude, you will at best suffer a good deal, and at worst, you will get in your own way over and over again. What, while some people say that attitude is everything, it isn't. It is a damn good start, and with proper attitude at the start, the mood for the journey is appropriately set. What is the right attitude? I hope that at this point you're asking that question. If not, please reread the last few paragraphs. If so, please take a nice, comfortable breath, get curious, and I will tell you a little story. Once upon a time, there were two men. One of these men was big and strong and smart. The other wasn't very big, wasn't very strong, lacked the smarts the good Lord gave him. While there were many differences between these two men, the difference that made the difference was attitude. The first man, the bigger, stronger, and smarter of the two, approached each situation with confidence as though what he knew was much greater than what he could learn. He approached new challenges full of himself, up to the task, and certain both that he would succeed and that he already knew everything. The second, smaller, weaker, and not-so-bright man approached every situation as though he missed almost everything all the time and grateful for anything and everything that came his way. He was curious, continually questioning, and attentive. He knew well that what he knew was only a small piece of what could be known, and he was thrilled each moment, tickled by everything and everyone that he, everyone and anything and everything that he learned. A new life, a new attitude. The place to begin your new attitude is with a theoretical and then practical appreciation of one simple and incontrovertible fact. You miss everything almost all the time. 
and act as though you get almost everything all the time. Now, this was what he was saying to me, right? Now, this is what he would say to most people, right? Based on being human, but this is to me, right? Uh, I invite you to read that statement a few more times in the hopes that you will get it more fully and in doing so, miss a little bit less. You miss almost everything almost all the time and act as though you get almost everything all the time. You miss almost everything almost all the time and act as though you get almost everything all the time. This simple statement, thought and then experienced, provides an orientation you can use now and will need later. The statement begins a new description of your relationship with everyone and everything. At first, it may just seem like words, but as you begin to integrate it into more and more aspects of your life, you will discover that it assists you in letting go and lightening up when you need to. It's an ally which is always there always ready. Allow me to explain. Okay. So the next part is where, like the part I wanted to get to the, I years and years ago, my ex-wife and I, we were driving down to the keys. Um, and you know, it's like a two or three hour drive. And, uh, there are certain parts of the road where there's like speed traps and the speed limit is pretty low. I got caught on one of those speed tra traps. I got a ticket. I was upset about getting the ticket. My ex-wife, Debbie, was like, in my mind at that time, was taking the police officer's side, like, and saying like, hey, if you don't, you know, don't speed if you don't want to get a ticket. Um, you have nothing to complain about. And so me being uh, the immature child that I am, I then rode the rest of the trip at the speed limit, figuring like, well, look, if you're not going to support me when I get a speeding ticket, and you're saying I should just go the speed limit, if I'm not like, don't want to, then I'm just going to go the speed limit. And... Uh, Anyway, that was me being immature. But then this came, this story came up when uh, we were all going, I think, for dinner or lunch or something. And remember, this gentleman was my shadow. He went everywhere with me. So now he's going to show me a time that I missed everything. OK. And, you know, obviously you weren't there and this isn't applied to you, but I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have experiences like that. And that's why I wanted to share this with you. And this is, it drives back into meditation, everything that we were talking about. Okay. So there you are in the car with Debbie. That's my ex-wife. She brings up the Florida speeding ticket and you immediately want to set her straight or perhaps kill her. You know the truth. She is mistaken and you are driven to point that out to her, you, your kids, and me. In fact, you at that moment are fighting for your life and you don't even know it. You are holding on to what is true for you and you aren't even breathing. You hold your breath, you hold your truth, you lose your family, and you lose both your cool and the moment. There is nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with this reaction. It is human and it is much, much better than numbing or dumbing yourself down so that you don't react. You could hire an, an, an anesthetist to numb you out. Let's just not go that way. Instead, let's call on our new friend, our new mantra. You miss almost everything almost all the time while thinking that you get almost everything all the time. What are you missing in this moment? What are you missing in this moment that could transform your life? What are you missing in this moment that puts you on the defensive? What are you missing in this moment that has you be asleep? What are you missing in this moment? Are you missing the fact that you are raising your voice, your energy, and your stress level? Are you missing the fact that Debbie is suddenly having a very good time? Are you missing that you have closed the castle gate and are hiding behind your anger and upset? Are you missing how funny it is that someone so able could become so instantly resourceless? Are you missing the fun of life? Are you missing the agony of defeat thinking that you can still win? Are you missing the point that you are fighting so hard for what you're fighting so hard for is irrelevant? Are you missing that in that particular moment, you can learn more about yourself than in all your settled moments put together? That's the critical thing. And this is why meditation helps so much because the ability to do this when you're having a reaction requires a level of skill most people do not have, okay? Okay. Are you missing that in this particular moment, you can learn more about yourself than in all your settled moments together, in the moment of being upset, right? Are you missing your wisdom and perspective? Are you, in short, missing the joke? Are you missing that in that moment, in the midst of your compulsion, is also passion? Are you missing the instantaneous rise in your energy? If you miss almost everything, almost all the time, what are you missing in this moment? You are missing that in that moment, Debbie was energized, excited, and involved. In fact, you sought to shut her down. 
you missed that you were in reaction, lacking your usual reserve, and thus were in the midst of a powerful upset driven by basic insecurities that normally lurk behind the scenes beneath your typically calm surface in your depths. It is at moments like this, moments when patterns take over, patterns that normally don't show themselves, that you can glimpse your depths. Lesser people seek to avoid and minimize these moments, and by doing so, they minimize their self-knowledge. While I was visiting you, I asked you if you were an ass. You, after a little bit of thought, said, I can be. I replied, I am always an ass, always. So I never have to work, try to not be an ass. I don't have to edit myself. I don't have to live carefully. I don't need to dumb down my intelligence and energy. I love it when I'm right, and I love it when I'm wrong, because I love both. I can tell which is which. If I preferred one or the other, I wouldn't be able to tell which was which because I would need to have more of one than the other. A wise man misses almost everything almost all the time, and he knows it. An ass misses almost everything almost all the time and thinks he gets almost everything almost all the time, right? So I hope that that was interesting to some of you. My point is, is that you get what was shared with me in this book about me, which I should read more often, um, was that you get to see your programming. You get to understand how you are structurally aligned. And like when in the moment of upset, it's in the moment when you get upset, when you feel threatened, where you actually have access to what you currently don't know about yourself, right? Like in that moment, I was, I thought, right, I was annoyed that she didn't support me on that drive. And now she's telling a story about it, right? But I wouldn't be that annoyed if that was what was really going on, right? Like Ken Wilber said something that a quote a long time ago, well, he didn't say it to me. I read it, right? Um, but if it informs you, it's information if it affects you, like AFF, right, emotionally affects you, it's projection. So anytime anything emotionally upsets you, there's something deeper going on behind the surface. Now, being able to get access to that is difficult because you're in the moment of upset. You are, you're, you're, you, you've been hijacked by your amygdala. So meditation is one of the pathways to develop the skill to be able to accomplish self-awareness, to be able to observe yourself in moments like this. And so like what the masters would say of spirituality and transformation is that your goal is not to change anything. It's just to be aware. And as you are able to observe it over and over and over again, new insights come to mind. So hopefully like you got value out of that. That's something that was written personally to me. It's very kind of like, uh, it's, it's interesting. I hope, and I hope you guys got value out of it. It's not something I normally would bust out and share with people because it is very private. Uh, let's go back to the other one so I can finally get this to where we wanted it to be. Got to get, share this other window. There we go. All right. Share. Right before I do that, though, let me just see what comments have come in. I'm surprised that that didn't get more comments because I think, like, I hope that you're busy thinking about it and that you're not like, yeah, no shit or something like that. Like, I hope that, I don't know if it's anywhere near as profound to you as it was to me, but I want you to imagine that in any given moment of you being upset or, like, emotionally, like, rattled, that there's a lot more going on about you inside than you recognize. And if we are closed systems, right, then what we have to recognize is that for that moment to happen, there was a perception. I made that perception mean something that was disempowering. And the better that I'm able to understand that, the better I'm able to understand what's really going on. Because it's not about the ticket. It's not about the speeding ticket or any of that. The conversation was, but the upset was not. And, and so that, like, that's what we're talking about when we say depth or like understanding the deeper aspects of this stuff. Um, 
Okay. So awareness of the language we are using in conversation, our thoughts is the key to being able to begin interrupting the pattern. As soon as you are aware of it, your timing will get better through repetition. Timing is critical. The first thing is just to notice it. If you could just notice it, things will change. You don't even have to work on fixing it. You just have to worry about noticing it. Uh, Rich, you read books or listen to them while speeding up the, the pass. I do it all. Right. So a lot of times the first time I go through a book, I am using voice reader. Voice dream is really the one I like. Um, and that reads to me and paces. So I'm looking at the text at the same time. Generally, I can go through a book at about like the fastest uh, voice dream goes is 675 words a minute. Uh, so that's as fast as I go on that. Um, at 675 words a minute, you can go through like a bookstore book in about under two hours. Um, the first pass through a book is generally that way. If the book is worth me rereading and highlighting so that it makes its way into my Evernote, I will then read the book again, highlighting, and then those highlights will go into Evernote. Then I will highlight again and start stripping away stuff. So it's a multi-layered process. I've gone over it in other live streams, and I'm sure you can find them like in uh, on YouTube or Facebook or wherever. Um, Okay. Uh, perception is reality. Transformation is elevating the conscious ladder. Understanding spiral dynamics eases the process of moving to a higher consciousness, which leads to different perceptions. Yeah, I'm a fan of uh, spiral dynamics. I wouldn't say that I'm an expert at it, but I'm certainly familiar with it. I've read a few books on it a while ago. Uh, your attitude will determine your altitude. That's a great writing. Is, is there any possibility to share with us the book or at least that chapter? I can't share that. It's too personal. It's all because it's all like about me, right? Like, and my challenges and what I need and the mistakes I'll probably make and stuff like that. Um, but I'll pull from it at times. Uh, that was major. I'm glad you thought so, Josh. Uh, so everyone with bad attitudes has an unfriendly view of the world. No, I'm not saying that. So I think we are all well-deserving of nasty, low vibrational bullshit they bring to the table. Energy vampires, ridiculous. I don't know that that's the case. I don't know where you got that from, Emmy. Uh, very interesting. Cool. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Cool. Just arrived now. Sorry, I'm late. Always good to see you, Dr. Vogelman. Great value. Thank you. Quite something. Yeah, it's... How did I receive that? I received it really well, actually, because I think it was he was 100% right. Like, in the moment, right? I didn't. He didn't tell me in the moment. I was reading this, like, you know, way after. And what I recognized was that he was entirely right, that like in that moment, I was kind of fighting for my life. I mean, not really. I was just having an argument or a disagreement. But it did mean more to me and it shouldn't have. And I did understand that like in order for me to get that upset, it had to have meant more than to me. And so what was that really about? Like, what is that like? Nerve that is being poked at that really had me like in reaction. Um, because when you're in reaction, right, you're not empowered, you're not your best self. And so it wasn't what she said, right, that made me go into reaction. It's what I made what she said mean. Um, very insightful. Uh, conscious awareness is the key to improving perception. Yep. Great value, Rich. The chapter is so deep, I'm still reflecting on it. Uh, if it affects you, it's projection, key insight. Yeah, that was Ken Wilber who said that. My wife and I have started communicating more about our perceptions on our interactions. The best book I ever read, Chris, well, there's two books that for relationships, like I think are so valuable. One is like, you know, pop psychology, but still very good. Uh, the five languages of love or five love languages or whatever. And then the most powerful process that I ever went through with anyone that I had a relationship with um, it's something called nonviolent communication. There's a book on it by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, he's the developer of it and it is incredibly powerful. I was actually first taken through that process by a psychologist. And, um, I was like, whatever you just did, I need to learn. That was insanely powerful. Um, so anyway, um, it hits hard, but it's a great opportunity when someone holds up a mirror to you like that. Yes. But you know, the, but the takeaway there is applied to everyone. Wherever you lose your shit, whatever like gets you like, you know, in reaction, there's something deeper in the surface. And it's so hard in that moment to be a witness of what's currently going on. But like, but with meditation, with practice, you ultimately can do that. And so that like the point of meditation is not so that you don't have any miscellaneous random thoughts 
the point of meditation is to be able to notice those sooner and be able to go back quicker, right? So that ability to spot thinking, being lost in your mind, is the same practice of being able to notice when your mind is taking, taking you down a path. All right, so let's go back to the notes. Okay, I think I've already, let's see. Oh, cool. All right. Um, all right, so, okay, so here we go. So this we went over, so we're going to go through this quick. But let's see. All right. But okay. So we'll just start here. When you learn, you go through a common sequence, no matter what it is that you learn. First, you declare that something is missing, such as a good tennis swing or the ability to make fresh pasta. Here's what is missing in our ability to be aware and effective in observing language, right? That's what, like, you're about to learn something. So here's what is missing in our ability to be aware and effective in observing language. Then you find a coach, a book, or a teacher to help you with your learning. Next, you either make a request of the teacher or begin to study the book in a mood of openness to learning. Behind your willingness to begin is the assumption that you can learn and that the book or teacher will assist you. You trust your ability to learn. Finally, you listen or read, practice, and correct a universal cycle of learning of building a new body for action. This sequence of learning is what I ask that you do here. The topic or domain for learning is language or linguistic behavior. Remember that you're dealing with habits like somatic or emotional habits. We have languaging habits. They have a life of their own. As you increase your ability to observe yourself, new possibilities will be available to you. Only five actions that you make in language, right? And here they are. Requests. A request is an action that you take when you seek the assistance of another in satisfying an underlying condition that you have. You want something. A request is made in the present, at the moment you say it, but it invites a future action by, an, by another or others. A request involves commitment on the part of the requester to be satisfied if the conditions specified in the request are met. If these conditions are met and the requester is not satisfied, the person fulfilling his promise may see the requester as manipulative, unfair, or demanding. Okay, so that's first. One is requests. Right? Two are promises. A promise is what you speak to indicate your commitment to fulfilling what someone else has requested. It implies that you understand his or her request fully and that you are competent and sincere about fulfilling what he or she has asked. Trust is very important judgment that we make about someone's rigor and sincerity as a promiser. When promises are not fulfilled and a person fails to take care of the consequences of that failure, the requester may feel betrayed or become resentful and begin to distrust that person. What is important to see here is the fundamental social action of trust lives in our assessment of others' sincerity, of others' sincerity, ability, and responsibility to keep their promises and commitment. Without trust, relationships, organizations, and societies are in a state of constant vigilance and chaos. Kind of describes where we are today. Declaration. So that's the third one, right? We've got promises, requests, declarations. A declaration is an utterance in which someone with the authority to do so brings something into being that wasn't there before. So when a judge says, I now pronounce you man and wife, like a justice of the peace, right? That couple is now married, right? When an umpire says, strike three, you're out. That is now a reality. They speak it into truth, right? The Declaration of Independence is an example of that kind of linguistic act. The United States was brought into existence when a group of men empowered to do so declared independence from England. Of course, they had to back up their speaking by many other actions, fighting a war, setting up laws for the new country, etc. But with the Declaration, the possibility for our country was created. Personal declarations such as, I will lose 30 pounds by July 1st, or I will listen to my wife's concerns with more patience, have the power to shape our lives if followed by consistent behavior. The question to think about around declarations are, does this person have the authority to make this declaration? And what is the person's level of personal commitment to living his or her life in a way that will fulfill that declaration? One of the most important of our personal declarations is the act of forgiveness. This crucial declaration is a commitment not to carry past resentment into the present and future. We are all humans and make mistakes, sometimes agrarious, agrarious ones. 
people break their promises to us in ways that cause that may cause us pain. The act of forgiving allows us to free ourselves from the burden of guilt, anger, and resentment. Trust allows us to live at peace in relationships, and forgiveness allows us to free ourselves from resentments and build life anew. Forgiveness is not about forgetting, we remember. Hence, forgiveness is a stance that we must declare over and over again whenever resentment and anger arise. Okay, so we have, right, we've got declarations, we've got promises, we've got requests, right? Now we have assessments. An assessment is a judgment that you make about the world in the interest of taking some action. In the interest of going to a ball game, I might say, make the assessment, it's a beautiful day in which no wind and a temperature of 80 degrees are my standard. On the other hand, in the interest of going sailing, my assessment, it's a beautiful day, means that the wind is blowing, the harder the better. In both cases, the assessment beautiful implies first a statement for the sake of something sailing or baseball, then a standard, no wind or 20 knots, and finally a judgment, beautiful or not beautiful. Assessments are never the truth. They are statements people make that fulfill some concern with their particular standards. Assessments are never facts, even though a lot of people may share that assessment. They are always informed by the interest and standards of the person making the statement. However, assessments may be grounded or not. They may be some evidence on which the assessment is based. In the case of baseball game, the temperature of the day. In the case of sailing, the wind velocity. Rigor is related to the diligence and skill a person has in grounding assessments. A doctor, for example, is a person who has been schooled in making grounded assessments for the sake of improving patients' health. A lawyer makes grounded assessments for the sake of clients' interest under the law. See, it all happens in language. Your historic narratives are assessments of yourself and others. Others are smarter than me. You can't trust men. The future is hopeless. These assessments are generally ungrounded, but nonetheless determine what actions you will and will not take. Pause for a few minutes and examine some of the automatic assessments that shape you. Think about age, money, race, physical appearance, health, and sex. What are the ungrounded truths that dominate and influence your life? Next, assertions, right? An assertion is a statement that you make for which you are willing to provide evidence. In other words, a society builds, in other words, a society builds certain ways of establishing and asserting common, often quantitative, value, weight, length, height, time, IQ, etc. These assertions live for us as facts. They are either true or false. If you make an assertion and cannot provide proof, sometimes you have to withdraw the assertion. If you make assertions contrary or ignoring the evidence, then you are mistaken or lying. Requests, promises, declarations, assessments, and assertions are the five basic building blocks of linguistic behavior. It took me years to embody this material, and I'm still engaged in breaking old habits and developing more rigor. So don't expect to learn it all at once. Remember that learning involves structural alteration of your body. This takes practice and more practice. As you begin to look with these distinctions, you'll see more. As you see more, you can do more. Then you'll begin to embody these skills and they will happen without conscious thinking. Be patient with yourself. Communication failures cause havoc. The fundamental challenge of relationships guaranteed to produce miscoordination and conflict is a failure to listen. As I've said, communication and language between two people is communication between two biological beings with liter who literally live in different cognitive universes. When you speak to another person, his or her system is triggered in unique ways that differ from how you would be triggered. When you speak, you are literally joining two worlds. The cardinal sin of communication, which compromises all speech and relationship, is assuming that what was said is what was heard. To avoid this, you must ask, observe, inquire, discuss, and listen for what, other, for what the other person understands. I call the common failures of communication the 10 linguistic viruses. I call these breakdowns linguistic viruses because they attack relationships, alter the structure of the individuals in them, and cause dissatisfaction, bad moods, and even ill health. Learning what they are will allow you to listen to others more effectively and heal them and yourself. The 10 linguistic viruses. Number one. Not making requests. 
Now, I did a whole thing on this when I did my, um, my transformation workshops where I spent two hours having everyone really think through their vision, what was currently missing in their business, and then everyone that they knew and everyone that they knew who knew people of all the people that they could ask for anything that's currently missing in their ideal version of their business currently. Because like, just because it's missing in the world doesn't mean that like, just because it's missing from your business doesn't mean it's missing in the world. And oftentimes if you ask, people will help you. Now, most people don't have that as like a way of being like that. Most people will help you when asked, although like, that's the way I perceive it. And it's one of the reasons people always tell me that I'm unique in the number of people that I will go speak to about my idea and ask them like, what sucks about this? Make this better. Like, and I will do this. I'm not really happy right now with the webinar that sells steal our winners. Like I think it can be better. And so I like, I just sending it to Todd Brown. I'm going, when I'm in Cabo, I'm going to like ask a couple people to review it. I will do that. I will make those requests. What I had to do with the transformation people at my office was force them to go get dinner by making requests. They were, they had to, I did it myself too. I forced them to go, like the goal was like they had two hour break for dinner. Here's the deal. You're not allowed to buy dinner. You're not allowed to tell anyone why you can't buy dinner and you have to go out and get someone not in this room who is here that you've never met before to buy you dinner or to give you dinner. Good luck. Everyone ended up eating dinner, although they weren't very happy about this assignment when they start, when I started it. Right. Um, but they were able to get a stranger to give them food. And so then we came back to like this list of people that had had could help them get their business further along faster. And they just got food from a stranger. Right. They have some connection to the, these people that were on their list. And so I find that a lot of people are afraid of making requests. So let's talk about it. Often people think there's something that they want or need from someone, but they don't make a request. Why is this? One reason is, is that you may have a reticence or fear about asking others. I certainly had that early on in my life. They could say no to your request. This might be painful for you and cause you to feel rejected. In fact, in point of fact, a no to request is just that, a no to the action of requesting, not a rejection of the person, but that's what some of us hear. Another reason people don't make requests is that they're afraid others will think they're incompetent. They assume that they should do and know everything by themselves. Again, this is faulty thinking. Making a request is not a mission of weakness. In fact, one aspect of power has to do with the capacity to make powerful requests. So requesting does not imply weakness. A request simply invites another person to participate in your life. Take this as a way to honor others, not to burden them. Still, another reason people don't make requests is they think a request is an imposition. Shy people especially have this orientation. They forget that one way that people achieve meaning in their lives is fulfilling the requests of others. You show respect for people when you ask them to participate in your life through a request. Unfortunately, to our, unfortunately, due to our historically formed bodies, it may not look that way. Okay, so that's number one, requests. Two, living with uncommunicated expectations. One of the most common and pernicious forms of not requesting occurs when an individual lives in a world of shoulds and expectations that are really unexpressed requests. Often, we have private conversations with ourselves about what others should and should not do, but we never make overt and open requests of these people. Sub subsequently, when they don't do what we expect, of course, because we didn't ask, we're disappointed, resentful, and angry. These, they are setups for conflict, right? Like any place where you are not clearly communicating your expectations, it's a recipe for a problem. Number three, making unclear requests. Well-intentioned people fail when they try to fulfill unclear requests. A lack of clarity in your request may have generated the breakdown. It's foolish to think that others should know what you want. Remember that others don't necessarily see the world as you do. To coordinate successfully, your request must be precise and detailed. You're not insulting the listener if you make detailed requests. You're setting up the possibility for your mutual satisfaction. Unclear requests also occur when you don't have the time to clarify what you want in sufficient detail to have the promiser understand what you want. Here are some un here are some examples of unclear requests. Husband to wife, I want you to support my career. 
Can you see that the husband may have unclear or different picture than the wife on, what's, on what that's supposed to look like? What kind of support? What actions? When? All of this is missing, right? Doctor to patient. Get back to me if you don't feel better. The patient is left thinking, mm, what does he mean by feel better and how much better and how long will it take to feel better? Should I be worried if I'm not better tomorrow? I don't want to bother him, but I'm confused. The unclear request leaves the patient anxious and feeling that the doctor doesn't care. Customer to waiter, I'd like coffee. What is missing is iced or hot coffee with dinner or after with milk or cream or black. If milk, what kind of milk, right? So this unclear requests. It's one of the reasons, right, that like when I do a full day or even a, when I do a full day consult or a, an hour long consult, I always start it with what has to be true that is currently not true to make this the best investment of your life. Because people don't come in with clear requests, right? And so I'm forcing them to make, get clear on exactly what they want. So I'll just repeat that question because a lot of people have learned that question from me, right? A lot of coaches who do consults and stuff like that. What needs to be true when we're done that is currently not true that when true, this will be the most, the best investment of your life, right? What I'm basically asking for is the goal of this, right? And when a lot of times when I'm having a conversation like or a meeting with someone, I'm like, what is the goal of this meeting? Because I want to be very clear about what are the requests on the table that I'm not clear about, right? I'm always trying to make people's requests as clear as humanly possible. I do that in consulting by asking people what needs to be true that isn't true right now by the time we're done to make this the best investment of your life. And when I'm in a meeting, I'm like, what are we trying to achieve here? What's the outcome of this meeting? What are we trying? Like, this is a successful meeting when what? So that I'm clear about what we're aiming for, right? Unclear requests also occur when you don't take the time to clarify what you want in sufficient detail to have the promiser understand what you want. Here are some, okay, wait, we already did that, All right? Okay, not observing the mood of requesting, okay? Some people make requests like demands or conversely, they make requests like a beggar. When you do this, you fail to see the mood of your utterance as much as your words affects the listener. If you're demanding, people might decline your request because they see you as arrogant and righteous or they might, make promises to you out of intimidation, not choice. Remember, coordinating actions in life is like dancing in language. Five, promising even when you aren't clear what was requested. Committing yourself when you aren't clear about what you're committed to is foolish. If this is the case, you can either go back and request clarification or plot on, hoping that everything will work out. You may fail to notice that this statement of committed confusion produces anxiety in you. And when you fail to produce the desired result, distrust in the other party. If you're not sure what the requester wants, clarify it with him or her. You won't look stupid. Rather, you're, you'll be building an identity of being committed to fulfilling his or her request. Okay, we've got a few more here. I just want to make sure that we cover the tent. Six, not declining requests. Some of us say yes to every request. We've been trained to please other people, and this is made manifest in our compliance. Uh, we believe we're good people. We believe it's bad to say so, to say no. The problem with this belief is that it's destructive for both you and others. Let's look at yes sayers first. They are often overloaded with promises to keep. There simply isn't enough time to do it all. The result is a perpetual fear of failure, which prompted the compliance in the first place. A vicious circle is established, which generates anxiety, burnout, and exhaustion. Something else happens to yes-sayers. They end up doing a lot of things they don't want to do. They lose their right to live their life by their own standards and declarations. Ultimately, they lose dignity and self-respect. Over time, people become distrustful of yes-sayers. They think you just never can be sure about him or her. He's not sincere. The ability to decline requests is crucial for health and dignity. Seven, breaking promises without taking care of undermine, without taking care and hence undermining trust. I want to show the human and biological consequences of a broken commitment to coordinate action. When you make a promise, you're committing yourself to a future action and building expectations for that action in the other party. Trust in the assessments of, other, of, a, of the other person that you will fulfill your promise. 
When someone says, I trust you, he or she means, I assess that you are sincere, competent, and reliable to do what you promised. When you trust someone, have a grounded assessment of his or her trustworthiness, you rest at ease and expect what was promised. If the promise is broken, you begin to lose trust in that person and feel betrayed. If you ignore your promise and go on knowingly, you're consciously betraying your word and not taking care of the other party. When I do this, I feel awful. In contrast, if I contact the requester, describe the present problems that are keeping me from fulfilling my promise, apologize for the broken promise, offer to make a new promise in the time frame that I can guarantee, and assist with the cleaning up of any mess that I produced, we are both relieved. Our relationship can even strengthen from this mutually caring action, even though I didn't keep my promise. Number eight, treating assessments as the truth or as assertion slash facts. I remember Umberto Maturana saying, everything that is said is said by someone, right? Everything that is said is said by someone. His statement looks absurdly self-evident, but he was describing a deeper phenomenon. Your judgment are a function of your history of living and the standards for satisfaction that you embody. There is no truth to your statements of judgment, just what you say. You can provide evidence for what you say, but that still does not make it the truth. On the other hand, an assertion is a statement about the world for which you can provide evidence. It is either true or false in this sense. Assessments are grounded for assertions, we must provide evidence. If we treat assessments as the truth, conflict arises. Number nine, making assessments without rigorous grounding. Even though your judgments aren't the truth, you can make them with rigorous grounding, i.e. you can say what you say based on evidence. In a court of law, a verdict is an assessment, guilty or innocent. A jury makes these assessments after weighing the credibility of the evidence or grounding. Then they make a judgment. What is important in the law is equally important in medicine. A medical diagnosis is only an assessment. To make this assessment, it must be carefully grounded by lab tests and extensive medical history, a physical examination, x-rays, and so forth. And last but not least, making fantasy affirmations and declarations. Number 10. When you make a fantasy affirmation and declaration, you assume that it will happen by itself. Powerful, intentional people do not indulge in fantasy affirmations and de declarations. Their word is an embodied word, and they mobilize their life in pursuit of their goals. This does not mean that they are always guaranteed success, but their intent and direction is at one with their declarations. An affirmation or declaration pictures a reality that does not exist yet, but is attainable through a series of reasonable steps. The 10 linguistic viruses not only create ineffectiveness and friction between people, but also produce negative mood states, which in turn threaten your well-being and health. People who can't decline requests place their health in great jeopardy. They are often overburdened and become exhausted, burnt out, and depressed. They become anxious, driven, or resentful and avoid people who might make requests. Promising when you aren't clear what you've been asked is something you're likely to do when you don't want to look stupid or when you want to please someone. As the time grows nearer for a completion of your task and uncertainty grows, you become anxious and tense. Your anxiety may be reflected in jaw pain, bowel problems, or headaches. People who hold their assessments as truth are generally rigid or arrogant. People who make assessments without rigor are viewed as flaky and full of opinions that change like the weather. They aren't taken seriously and they often suffer from insecurity and low self-esteem. Low self-esteem is a major risk factor for psychosomatic symptoms such as insomnia. Gossip is an especially pernicious kind of assessment which lacks rigor and purpose. People who gossip use assessment not as a basis for action, but as a basis for characterizing another person who is absent from the conversation. If you take your promises seriously, not communicating broken promises can produce a sense of shame and guilt. Others begin to distrust you and your public identity suffers. Your possibilities in life shrink. You go around depressed and have little energy to accomplish your goals. All right. So those are the 10 linguistic viruses. And we've got like five minutes left to kind of wrap this up. Let's see what you guys had to comment there. I hope you got value from that. The goal is to recognize that right now, odds are that you, you live in language like we all do, but you don't have necessarily the, as many distinctions as you could have as it relates to language.
And so because you don't have those distinctions, you aren't seeing things that you could see. And because you're not seeing those things, you can't do those things either that base, based on those seeings, right? So, at, and as the gentleman who wrote this book, or, you know, because it's two doctors who wrote it, but, you know, the toy saying I, so um, to really embody this, it's not like, oh, I get it, right? Like, oh, okay, there are these five different things that can be done in language, and now I know this. No, you've been exposed to it. For you to embody it means that, like, something is said and you, oh, it's a request. Oh, that's an assertion. Oh, that's an assessment, right? Like not having to think about it, it just shows up that way. Like the request and the label of request shows up at the same time, right? That's part of Maturana's thing is that perception and knowing are coupled together in the brain. So that understanding then opens up lots of possibility that knowing those distinctions. Now, where to go from there, like I've got tons of books about like really understanding this on a much deeper level. And each book kind of adds to like a, adds another piece to the puzzle, right? So that like it, you're not only exposed to it, right? But that you actually can start to internalize it and embody it. And so that is what it's all about. And um, oh, wow, um, I've got a team member in town. Her name is Lydia. And so I am going to just see what you guys had to say, and then we'll call it a day. Um, all right. All right. Uh, violence stems from the ability of not communicating what you feel. You can, for sure. Uh, thank you, Rich. I appreciate it. Shared five times. I appreciate you, Dr. Vogelman, hugely. Powerful. Glad you thought so. Um, I, was I was born with ADHD and hyperactive. In the 70s, the only options doctors gave my mom was Ritalin. She told the doctors to take a hike and enrolled me in transcendental meditation. Within 30 days, there were no issues. Recently, I suggested to someone to close to me that suffered from severe depression to join TM 90 days later, virtually cured. I'm 62 and meditate every day. Feel great mentally and physically. That's great, Dory. And I meditate almost every day. Um, almost every day. Uh, forgiveness for your mind. The rest will follow. Structural alterations in your body are primarily neuroplasticity. Change the size of your axons. Uh, I think assessments is mandatory. I did an assessment in the past using the questionnaires, which was built into software results showed that I have a collaborative profile understanding that helped me a lot. Yeah. Look, we, it's not that assessments are bad, but when we take an assessment as truth, as opposed to our opinion about things, that's where it can be potentially problematic. Uh, two of my favorite books are Deborah Tannen. You just don't understand women and men in conversation. Would you recommend that book? Not only like I get that it's your favorite, um, but interested. Uh, oh, and then talking nine to five. All right. Would you recommend those books, April? Because I would check them out if you recommend them. Daryl, thanks for sharing. You rock. Uh, if you don't shit on me, I won't shit on you. Uh, a request can imply vulnerability, not weakness, which is good. And people generally react really well to someone comfortable with their vulnerability about an issue. Totally uh, spot on, Tommy. Spot on. Uh, some people expect you to be a mind reader. A lot of people do. I want every coffee on your menu. <laughs> uh, my opinion is that generalization is, is the way our brains work. Omitting details and putting information in a general package, requesting details from other is the best way to comprehend most situations. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Hamza. I need an antiviral stat. <laughs> Uh, great insights, gain clarity on a couple things. Great. Glad to hear, Stefan. Stephen. Uh, huge value. I had no idea how important language was, and I would never have had that distinction. Thank you. My pleasure, Josh. Um, a family friend who was a renowned hypnotist got me to stop using the phrase, driving me up a wall. It greatly improved my outlook and my level of success. Interesting. Thank you very much, Rich. You're welcome, Jay Goddink. Uh, you are a great man to Rich. Thank you. My pleasure, Hasma. Well done. Organized and valuable thoughts for action and tools to use for clarifying communication. Thanks, Rich. You are welcome. So you recommend them. Good, April. I took pictures of those and I will check them out. 
Uh, totally recommend them. Cool. Uh, thank you, Rich. I'm grateful for this. Hit me right where I needed to be. Increase my communications. Still, if I had to pick one book that really I thought was the most powerful book I've ever read as it relates to language, it was a culmination of a lot of the stuff that I've cover here and I will cover in other books, but is Language in the Pursuit of Happiness by Calmer Brothers. Don't know him, don't have any, but you know, just really great book. Uh, amazing Rich, thanks Bill. Uh, thanks Rich, speak to Steve, speaking to Steve on Thursday. Cool, all right, and so uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful week. My hope is, is that by the time you see me next, I'll be back. From Mexico and Las Vegas, I go from Mexico straight to Vegas to present somewhere, and then I'm back here. Um, and my hope is, is that I am 100% healthy when I get back. Fingers crossed. My heart rate is still about, my resting heart rate is still about 10 beats elevated over the last couple of weeks than what it normally is. My doctor said, uh, no need for concern, just take it easy. And so every day I look at the gym and I just have to, be sad that I can't be doing it right now, even though I'm jonesing too. So that's a wrap to Higher Profits Beyond. Rich Sheffern over and out. You'll see Matt on Thursday. You'll see me in two weeks.